and welcome to Holy Crow. We have a, up here in the studios tonight, Abby Hockman, and uh, we're going to talk about all sorts of different things, his book a little later. I think you want to start off with some some words or just talking about well, Ireland just, a little. Uh, um, about four months ago, I'd gotten uh, deported from uh, Belfast th through the uh, cooperation of Scotland Yard and uh, the courts here in this country who ordered me back. And uh, a number of my friends who I'd met with from the, uh, well, I don't even know if I should say where they were from, but let's say people involved in the freedom struggle there had been picked up and put in jail. And uh, um, when I was watching tonight, you know, on the news, uh, you know, the reports from uh, Belfast, I was uh, reminiscing about those times. I had given the... Uh, uh, about three days ago, I called up a group in London called the Friends Magazine, uh, who had introduced me to the people in Belfast, and they're establishing a fund for political prisoners, a defense fund for Irish political prisoners, and I gave them uh, the entire rights uh, to steal this book. It's going to be coming out in England. Not just the oh, royalties, I might mention but, uh, that Steal This Book is the title of your new book, which just came out, which we'll that. be talking about a lot later, probably. So yes. I thought maybe we play, could play the... Uh, I uh, brought back some Irish songs uh, from Ireland when I was there, and I thought maybe we could play them. The first one is uh, A Rising of the Moon, uh, done by a group called the Dubliners, one of whom I met. Maybe we could play it. It's a traditional uh, Irish fight song. Okay, we'll listen to that. Right. There are thousands of these songs. Mm -hmm. The Napal Nation wants to get them. They have thousands of them. They're all singing drunk all the mm -hmm. time. They gave me this... Uh, this is a snuff box uh, used by Miara Riedon, a woman who fought in the original Easter uprising in uh, 1916 or 17 with James Connolly. And uh, she died about 1952, and it was her snuff box, and the uh, IRA gave it to me. So, uh, so. If maybe somebody knows of some... Uh, I don't know the scene here in the States too much about what kind of groups and the politics of... Uh, you know, the different groups involved in the uh, Irish civil rights struggle. But uh, maybe somebody knows and could clue me in, because uh, I have some real good friends who are up there. If anybody does, they can get in touch with the station. Uh, we'll give out an address later on, and uh, I can yeah. transfer it on to you. If you just tuned in, like a few minutes late, um, I'm Elliot Crow, and... We're talking to Abby Hoffman. How would we classify you? <laughs> I know you're wearing it. I, yeah. <laughs> I ain't Irish. <laughs> well, I really, I'm, I'm, I didn't expect to be talking about it, and I really don't have any questions or anything. So, uh, how would how would you classify yourself? I mean, you know, to give an introduction, oh, you call know. yourself a yippie or uh, this, people Long, who you were working with. Uh, Long infantilism. <laughs> <laughs> the people who uh, you're There's working with that, to make your uh, record, which you said you did yesterday, the ZBS media people. They sent out a, a sheet and it said uh, classified you as a um, contemporary radical, I think, and, and a regular mischief maker. Yes. Uh, so nice. whatever. I, I guess there are a lot of adjectives. I don't know because uh, I was just on the uh, CBS show, uh, C CBC, I think, Canadian Canadian radio. Oh, yeah, CBC. There's yeah. a big fight up there because this book steal this book is banned there. Yeah. And not only banned, but uh, by the government, uh, for which I'm ba I'm banned too. I think I set yeah. the Canadian League record by getting deported twice from that country. But uh, the book, uh, about a week ago, uh, they were being smuggled in, and uh, the Quebec Provincial Police raided the warehouse in Montreal and stole it. So they were asking, you know, like, you philosopher, artist, this, that. Yeah. Maybe you could I just never, uh, yeah, run down what the book one, is about. One of my parents' great disappointments is that I, I never stuck with a career. What, are they, what so, do they say now? What, you know, do they? Uh, you know, they're confused. You know. Yeah. Could you just like run down basically what the book is for people who don't know? No, you don't have well, to. Well, it's basically uh, how to steal everything. Yeah. I mean, uh, it it uh, it it uh, its greatest moment is on yeah, with its cover and it steadily decreases to the back of the book, which has a picture of me stealing the book. <laughs> and the list of 30 publishers who rejected it. Yeah. Right, I was forced to publish it myself, which was uh, some trip. But it has uh, it has advice on how to steal just about everything in the country. Uh, you know, and uh, how to start underground newspapers, do guerrilla television, radio, survival stuff, survival and fight. 
survive fighting. Yeah. It's great. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, how long did the, the whole bit with the publishers last on? I mean, you know, being that rejected. Went, that went for that phase of the book. There are a number of phases. Uh, that phase lasted about three and a half months, four months. And uh, But actually, it delayed. This book should have come out about in December, and it came out in the middle of April. So, uh, unfortunately, some of the information is a bit stale, you know, because you know, modern-day capitalism keeps changing, and, of course, you know, the fluid counterculture, I mean, a lot of the survival numbers, you know, keep changing and stuff. So. You mentioned... I'm going to do another one. You know, I'm going to oh. steal this book, too. Volume two. Okay. Um, you, we were talking before, and you mentioned something how you think capitalism is is gradually or steadily turning into a thing where th there'll be no money. It'll be all you know, credit cards and everything. Yeah, that yeah, that's that, uh, well, it's, it's like that. Yeah, no money. Well, actually, it's all based on gold, you know. But I, I never met anybody that had seen any of the gold. Have no. you? I mean, that's no. probably one. Well, of I, I don't think it's all based on gold now. I think since they came out with the the reserve notes and oh yeah, like that, yeah, they all, don't even need the gold. Yeah, faith in the USA and all that. Um, well, I it, forgot about how, including the chapter on how to rip off gold. How would one thing was that? interesting. Uh, no newspaper. When I speak of newspaper. I mean. Uh, you know, major daily newspapers mm -hmm. will accept, except the uh, San Francisco Chronicle will accept any ad for the book. You know, the chief, uh, you know, the chief paper involved, of course, is the New York Times, which refuses all ads. And it was interesting because uh, they said they refuse the ads because the book advocates illegal activity. So I sent them this letter that I had a chapter on stealing classified information, but I thought it was <laughs> too heavy to include in the book. <laughs> Um, it was weird, but it, you know, you see, there are limits of free speech. I mean, I try to write a book that nobody would publish, which is kind of hard if you've had two books that have sold, uh, have been very successful. Yeah. You know. So, uh, you know, random. How I just said, I'm, you're not going to publish this book, and they just couldn't believe it. And for six months, you know, while I was working on the book, writing it together, you know, while people were doing research and everything, all this activity was going on. They kept. They looked at about uh, ten different manuscripts of the book, ten different rewrites, and uh, you know, finally they just said we can't do it. Mm -hmm. Well, did you do this just like since you were saying that you were writing it so In no one would publish well, it? Were you trying to prove? Something? I had the title. Yeah. See, I did this book called Woodstock Nation for them, and uh, on the back of the book it said, "Steal this book." And when I was in Cook County Jail from this trial in Chicago that we had a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah, you remember. Yeah, Chicago right. 7. Uh, 8, 8, 10. 8, yeah. 200. The numbers change every day. <laughs> we don't like the number thing because that's yeah. uh, IBM, see? Immediately that's reduced true. to a number, you know? In fact, we used to play games. They'd say, you're in Chicago 7? I'd say, yeah, I'm number 3. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Uh, Should have gotten shirts. With anyway, I, we were in jail, you know, for a while there. Yeah, you know, waiting an appeal court decision on the bail. And uh, at that time, uh, the second printing of Woodstock Nation came out. And uh, when we got out, uh, I looked at the book in a bookstore and saw that on the back of the book, lo and behold, still this book had vanished. And I stormed up to Random House, you know, and I uh, went in and, and uh, you know, uh, grabbed Bennett Cerf by his bow tie <laughs> and said, you've just, you've just committed an act of censorship. You've destroyed, you know, my book. Yeah. I mean... Uh, I I relate to the books, frankly, as sort of painting kind of things. I mean, yeah. I don't, I, I can't read. I mean, I just can't <laughs> read. You know, I, I look at books, I feel them. You know, I I read them from back to front. You know, uh, uh, you know, I read reviews and lie and say I read the book. You know, uh, I can't read too good. So, um, but I knew that this was a bad thing that they had done. They had chopped the uh, thing off the book without yeah. telling me, and uh, we had we of course had a contract where they were not allowed to touch a word. So I started screaming and everything else to get your lawyers up, you know. So lo and behold, on the third printing, it goes back on, see. Mm. Then I get involved in, uh, you know, something else, I don't know, you know, another part of the country. The fourth printing comes out, and it's off again. See, because he kept getting these letters from book dealers, you know. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. How can you say that? So, uh, you know, the people who have Woodstock Nation can look on the back, and if it's an odd edition... They'll see steal this book if it's an even. They see the Random House version, which is castrated. 
So I figured it was doing so good on the back, right? I just had yeah. to get it on the front. <laughs> and I said, if I make it the title, no publisher can know what they're yeah. going to do. They can't, they, can't, they can't chuck it if it's the title, right? Mm. So uh, I had the title. Then it was just a, a matter of uh, devising the content. And yeah. I had done this uh, pamphlet called, uh, you know, uh, Bleep the System. Yeah. <laughs> <Simple> okay. <life>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we had given out free a survival manual on how to live free in New York and the uh, yeah. question of you know how you live free in the US. So uh, that was the genesis. The title is the heaviest, uh, you know. It's, yeah. it's you can't walk in the book I've seen loads and loads of people in bookstores where they carry it, which is about only one third the stores in the country. Yeah, I heard a story carry. about you um setting up outside Doubleday who refused to carry it with the whole mess of yeah. books and, and you were I I didn't get the story straight really. I think well, you're trying I was to sell them, but about, yeah, you and, know, I and, had about fifty and about forty got swiped and that, uh, <laughs> Well you can't really complain. Yeah. I made nine bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling fifty bucks, so what the hell, you know? <laughs> we ain't in it for the money. Well at least you yeah, at least you know <laughs> they're the listening glory. to you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh I did I just got back from Boston about a week ago. And we went into five stores in a row, and none of them had it. And I was with this reporter from the Globe. And they said, well, we're very concerned about shoplifting, you know. And said, so, you know, I don't know, ancient dinosaur cut people. So uh, I said, oh, yeah, huh? watch this. And I pick up, like, you know, a two-foot by two-foot Curry and Ives collection, volume 78, you know, the kind of book they review on the front page of the New York Times yeah. book review section, you know, that, that nobody... Uh, you know, you got to be 98, you know, a rear admiral <laughs> in the Navy to even want to begin to read it, right? <laughs> so I picked that book up, and I said, you're concerned about shoplifting, you ain't seen nothing. And I put it under my arm, and I walked right out the store, and they all, like, they stopped following me. I said, I said, you, chicken shit, go call the cops, go call them. Go ahead. They just stunned. They walked around. The reporter kept saying, we ain't to theater, huh? This is a put on. You're going to give it back. I said, no, no, I'm mad, man. I'm mad about this book. I mean, my other books, I wouldn't even talk about it on this radio show book because mm -hmm. I thought, you know, well, they promote, you know, all this hustling shit stuff. And, you know, I couldn't relate to it. How can you relate to a book that you've written in three, taking you three days to write? Yeah. You know? So, because uh, there's so many other things that I'm like into, you know, I'm not a writer. So, uh, but this book has become, you know, uh, a battle with the whole publishing industry. I mean, when, when uh, somebody like McGraw-Hill says, we'll give you $40,000 if you change the title in two chapters, you know, uh, you don't get that, that, those kinds of opportunities often enough, you know, where you can say, well, bug out, because that's not my trip, and, you know, I know you guys are on that trip, and, you know, mm -hmm. you, you just... You know, I know that I sent those editors to see the analysts for another year or two, you know, just by looking them in the eye. So that was worth it, you know. Mm. But if you go into a bookstore and you see with, that has a book and you watch the people, you know, they're looking at all these books, Zelda, you know, like, uh, what's the other one? God is an Englishman. Oh, that must be a real uh, loser. You know, they're looking at all these books. Now, all of a sudden, they come to this thing and it's a glaring title. I mean, it really hits you, right? It takes up the whole front cover. They yeah. smile. You know, it's made just the right size to fit in your pocket, you know, so they know they can, you know, like, they smile, they touch the book, and then they look over both shoulders simultaneously, <laughs> you know, and, and at, in that split moment, every idea that they have about property, about risk, about law, about their relationship to society, society's relationship, goes through their heads, and that's the meaning of the title, that's what it's supposed to do doesn't necessarily mean that the people are supposed to cop it. I mean, maybe it's not worth it, you know, to uh, get a $100 fine or something for co copping a uh, mm. $2 book, you know. Maybe it's not worth it. But people got to think about it real tight. And the storekeeper's got to think about it now because it's sold 200,000 books already in three months. It's sold or distributed? <laughs> well, <laughs> distributed, right, yeah. printed. Yeah. How did, how but did they are, it is, it is selling uh, mm. uh, yeah, the, the, the times best seller list. <laughs> the, the Times ran... Um, with, and this is with only one or two reviews in the country, barely no ads, mm -hmm. word of mouth, and two-thirds of the stores not carrying it. And loads of distributors not, you know? And uh, so, you know, uh, free speech has its limits. See, that's the point. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say certain things. The Times ran a big article or big uh, review in their book review section, I th you told me to read it. Um, it was a pen name I used. Dotson it was. Rader. Is it? Uh, do you? <laughs> no, it's a pen name. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, 
do you use that name all the time, or is there a real Datsun Raider? That's what the Times asked after I told them. Oh, because like, I was just reading another article by him today in Evergreen. No, I let him use it once in a while. Oh. No, he's, he's cool. Oh, well, that was a straight review. You did read yeah. you did write all, it, They though. will always give my books good review, which is weird, because I, I every book I write about the New York Times is the worst thing going, you know. Yeah. Well, it's They're trying to go the times off me. The, the <laughs> I, mean, times. I really like them. I like them for that review. Yeah. They've, they've uh, <laughs> uh, changed my consciousness, because mm-hmm. the review was an honest review in, in the fact that they did not omit the part about their own advertising department will not accept any ad for the book. Yeah, that was just going to point know, Which is like it's, pretty it's, honest it's for them to admit in the yeah. book. They got uh, over 500 letters concerning the, that review, more than they ever got on any book review in that they could remember. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a tremendous amount of letters for a book review. You know, mostly pro, attacking them for not accepting ads. So I submitted last week the entire review as an ad, see, to the Times. To the Times. And uh, I sent the letter up to uh, Salzburg. You know him. He owns the school, right? Isn't he? Yeah, I, he's one of the he's trustees. Right, one of the wardens. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, how did how did you get uh, Grove Press? To we'll see if they it? turned down their own review. Okay. Well, um, uh, Grove found out about it. That was interesting. I hadn't gone to Grove. Grove was not one of the thirty peop- publishers that I had gone to, and part of it was involved in a certain kind of strike that was going on there at the time, and we were having, you know, there's like political differences. Although I, I should say that I uh, I think I took the wrong side. I didn't understand Grove's point of view. They were they were having very severe financial problems. They did have to lay off people. It was true. In fact, they've just sold their entire distribution of uh, two or three of their lines of books to um, Random House. They've had to you know, and they've had to you know divest themselves of a lot of things. Cause there's a thing called a recession going on. You know, yeah. out there in the economy, they're losing <laughs> the country's losing money right yeah. and left. I mean, it's fantastic. Mm. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, but uh, I had already gone, I had already decided that I was going to print the book myself. I had gone around and raised the money, you know, and the book was at the printers, and then Grove found out about it. And uh, uh, it was it was kind of good of them, I think, to agree to distribute the book. They have, have had nothing but problems. I mean, loads of local distributors have dropped them. Bookstores yeah. say they'll never carry Grove. I mean, they are, uh, you know... They were kind of good to do it, so I, I could not have distributed it without them. I... Okay, well, so, um, uh, I guess we'll go maybe to some music and you know take a break. And... Okay, no good prison songs. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. Yeah, this is WKCR <clears throat> FM in New York City, by the way. And, People can't call in, are they? And uh, if he's ready with the record, yes. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes then. If you just tuned in, I'm Elliot Crow. I should say that. I don't like um, music. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm talking to Abby Hoffman. And, uh, yeah. well, we've been discussing your book. And, yeah. well, do you want to say anything about it? You can start. You said you wanted to, you wanted well, to get I, into they, just they, a, a conversation, it. so whatever. I can send two bucks to Pirate Edition, 640 Broadway, New York, and get it if they want it that bad. because I'm not against war. As I tried to make clear in the beginning, I support the liberation struggle in Ireland, Northern Ireland, mm. and the reunification of Ireland. So uh, I don't like to think of them as anti-war demonstrations. Okay, well, those things. Peace! Uh, yeah. Everybody's <laughs> Peace been now! There. Yeah. Everybody's been saying... One, like, one, 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 one! Hold on, let me That's get this out. Jesus yeah. 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 Everybody's been one, kind of one. throwing around ideas that... Uh, the May Day demonstrations were the the end of the mass demonstration era against the Vietnam War. Um, you were you were down there for a while, weren't you? I I don't remember. You were down there for a couple of days, and then you came up to it wasn't New York. Was the best ending? <laughs> Excuse me. It wasn't the best ending to the demonstration. No, or? to the era. No. Oh no, it wasn't. Um, well, um, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think it'll be 
um, huge demonstration, San Diego, the Republican Convention. You know, I think uh, it'd be a, I mean, maybe the nature demonstrations might change. You know, might be more political involvement. You know, in, in certain selected areas in the country, people might try a like Chilean-like approach. You know. That's like going on in Berkeley now, maybe Cambridge. That would be a real exciting area to try to deal, uh, you know, with real political power in a radical sense. I think that'll go on some places. In the Do you country. mean like a more violent sense when you say radical? Or, or? No, I'm uh, no. Uh, when I use the word political in that context, I meant through voting. Yeah. But with radical pl platforms, for example, there could be a lot of things like you know, uh, nobody who made under twelve thousand a year would be taxed any income. I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of things, corporation tax. You know, in terms of where cities get get their money, in terms of like uh, their control of the media, in terms of pollution. Uh, you know, all the issues that affect in, everybody. In your book, you went into the like, enforcement have, of uh, marijuana law. Yeah. Well, in the book, you went into you have a couple of chapters on on guns and. And yeah, fighting sure. and things well, like people that. People should know that too. They should know everything. Yeah. Well, should, from that, know. do you do you like advocate? You know, violence you should, you should know. Uh, I advocate a uh, flexibility, and uh, uh, you know, flexibility is you know, a revolution sort of like playing poker, and you don't uh, put down your hand, you know, until uh, the government puts down its hand, you know. And, uh, so, so saying, uh, you know, uh, one reason I don't like most of the demonstrations that say the peace coalitions, uh, people's peace, uh, we are for peace, love, 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 is because uh, that then becomes a chief issue. You know, uh, they go and they say, well, having demonstrations August fifth in uh, Washington, are they going to be peaceful? You're not going to throw rocks at you know. So immediately, everybody is not now. The major job of the organizers of the demonstration, the rallies is a definition of themselves and their reason for being and their reason for going to Washington. You see, uh, I think if they just say, uh, we're going, you know, and, uh, and uh, the images that they put out are unclear and that there's an element of suspense and an element of involvement in the part of the people, that they have to make their own decisions about, you know, violence and pacifism, that, uh, you know, that's much more involving and much more revolutionary attitude. Don't you think I mean, that it's absurd? That, it's absurd yeah. to say, but all these questions have to be considered tactically. I mean, it's absurd to say that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the uh, the IRA should put down their guns while they're occupied by twenty thousand British troops. You know, are running up and down their streets while they're faced with a condition in which uh, the unemployment level among Catholics is about forty nine percent. They have a slogan up in Belfast. You know. Uh, uh, how's your pa? Is your ma still working? Because uh, only the women can get jobs in the linen mills, you know, and it's potato soup every day. And uh, the British, you know, it's the last wet fight of Br British imperialism. That's what's going on there. So, uh, you know, when you're in a situation like that, or you're, uh, you know, a Vietnamese living in the Mekong Delta, and then, you, you know, uh, so uh, I, I think revolutionary struggles change, you know, uh, throughout the world depending on the environment. Well, don't you, know, you think that people but, uh, reading, that uh, people... Here, here, it's, it, they're tactical considerations. I don't think uh, mor morality is dependent on uh, the, the vigor and the amount of commitment one makes to the struggle for freedom. It has nothing to do with the type of weapons you use, frankly. Well, it's sort of like stealing. I make that point uh, in that quote, uh, in that article that appeared Sunday. Yeah. You know, on um, the difference between uh, a bandit and a revolutionary. A bandit, let's say, uh, a, a junkie, a uh, criminal, you know, uh, only is concerned with what they get, not with who they take it from. You see, a revolutionary is always concerned with who they take it from. So you can't really equate, you know, having someone Whether go out and shooting someone to, to stealing stealing a book or shoplifting or something. Oh, you? sure I can, sure. In, in terms of, yeah. Sure, I mean, in I terms don't see of how. how. Well, you, uh, you don't see how because you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you've not been involved, and I don't think you. I would bet you've never seen a gun. I have. You have seen one. Where? Yes. Not around, around Columbia. Not around Columbia. No. Um, Where? I went to Long Island. Island? Yeah. yeah. Where? I went Huntington, Long Island. Long Island. I went there hunting once upstate. I carried one. I didn't shoot it. Didn't get anything. But I've seen a gun. 
You killed Bambi! <laughs> Say ten Hail Marys. Get on your knees. <laughs> I can't. You killed it. Bambi! No, I didn't. I didn't even see it there. You butcher! <laughs> that was a long I mean, time I mean, I just shoot congressmen, senators. You killed Bambi! <laughs> you fiend. God, mass murder. Well, I, I still really don't see how you can equate... Um, if somebody's in a, in a, in a I building... Equate, I can equate smoke and dope with assassination of the president. I mean, you can, you can equate everything. You can say oh. that, look, you live outside the law, you're an outlaw, you're part of a growing culture, that culture's in conflict with a dying empire, you know, and uh, you, you, if you're interested in community, if you're interested in solidarity, if you're interested in defeating U.S. imperialism, if you're interested in changing a society that's racist, sexist, boring, you know, that guides itself by the Protestant ethic, lacks sensuality, you know, makes separations between work and play, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know. If uh, you're interested in, in living a new way of life, then you're interested in fighting that old way, and you're interested in uh, the fight, fight. But, fight team fight. Yeah. Don't you, don't you think, though, that if it, there aren't that fight many people li fighting that way, really, I mean, as percentage-wise or whatever, but... Well, people define fight in their own way, you know, but they're constantly, I mean, they're constantly programmed uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to be pacifists. In the, in the most, it's not unusual to say, uh, I mean, if we, you were having this discussion with some of my friends from the IRA, like I said, who, who, I mean, they would not understand what you're talking about. If we were in France, they would not understand. You know, if we were in Uruguay, they wouldn't understand. North Vietnamese wouldn't understand the thing you were talking about. It's only in the country, you see, that, uh, that owns 58% of the world's natural resources, which has the most imperialism of any empire, even the Roman, all those empires, Babylonian, were nothing compared to this one in terms of what it owns and what it controls. It's only in a country like this could there be a, you know, a, a, a strong pacifist movement among, a, 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 among radicals. You know? But I think it's changed. I mean, people that live it, you know, uh, counterculture, the hitchhikers, the people who have to survive on the Lower East Side, you know, which is essentially a junkie now, a jungle in a kind of way now, you know. They, uh, it's a good thing they don't, uh, they don't have your view, frankly, I think, you know. Well, I'm dead. not saying. I mean, they'd be dead. They no, I'm not saying that if if someone's coming after you, you shouldn't go after them. I'm just saying that you take people who are who are out maybe no, bombing that's, and things uh, like that. Well, I, I don't I don't see them as the same thing. I see you know like well, uh, it depends on where the bomb and, is. And you never yeah. waste a bomb like you never waste even waste a rock. And random violence produce, is, is random propaganda. It's absurd, you know. Uh, that, to that's get, what I mean. To get involved yeah. with, but uh, blowing up the Capitol is a uh, uh, very brilliant uh, revolutionary uh, theater, uh, very, you know, pinpointing a uh, symbol of power, the getting away with it, the fact that there's a living fighting underground that exists in this country, uh, is uh, an inspiration, I think, to all young people who want to start out on another new way of life. You say, wow, I mean, I'm, just, you know, I think about dropping out of school. I say, wow, there are people that the FBI can't even catch, and they're running around issue, issuing tape statements I mean, Bernadine Dawn was Fugitive of the Week Sunday on the FBI show. Did, did you see that? No. Yeah. You ever see uh, from Zimbalist the FBI? Yeah, I've seen it. Did you see? It's great. I watch a lot of my friends around. I see it from, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But at the end, you know, they come on and say, uh, if you've seen Miss Bernadine Dawn uh, running around, please do not try to apprehend her. She's armed and considered dangerous and known to resist arrest. Call your local FBI. Ding, ding, ding. We should call them now. I've seen her in the subway coming up. You know, but, uh, I mean, uh, see, I, d I identify with her. She's a uh, sister of mine, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bernadine wants to blow up the White House. That's, Bernadine's a lovely girl. <laughs> she can blow up the White House. Well, she can make her own decisions. <laughs> she's a, she's grown up. She's intelligent. Well, what happened if you, you say you walk up to her in the street and she, say she didn't know you? and, and I'd empty out my know. pockets and give her all my money. Well, if you didn't know her and she money. didn't know you and she... And she she, you know, uh, killed you or something. You know, it's. Times, but... Oh, what are you talking about? Well, you're you're equating, you know, that kind of violence with with blowing up the Capitol and. and no, I you think... we're we're. Uh, Maybe uh, I'm just misunderstanding you, but. Oh, you're confused because your image of violence comes from looking around, seeing a lot of police toting guns. Comes from uh, air forces that do indiscriminate bombing. You know, I haven't seen too many revolutionaries walking up and down the street shooting people right and left. Hmm. But it's interesting. I mean, I saw an FBI show, for example, where they do a, 
uh, a weather people type thing in, in Los Angeles. You know, there's the cadre, let's study them. You know, they're all like, ugh, they snotty, uh, psychotic, neurotic kids. You know, okay, what are they going to do? What's their plan? Their first plan is to strike a blow at justice, at the courts. So they're going to blow up a courthouse. Not just the courthouse, you know, like not like 4 a.m. They're going to blow it up to get the people inside, right? You're going to put the bomb there while the people... I mean, absurd, absurd, you know? Yeah. That's the FBI's view. That's your view, you know? Uh, they sign you up, man. You want their number, you call them up. Go, go, go join them. Because frankly, uh, you got, you know, uh, I don't think you're seeing things right. Well, maybe there's that's no, why you're uh, here. Che okay. said that there's, uh, there's no revolutionary. You think Che was a evil guy? He probably killed no. 20 or 30 people. I was a doctor. You know, he's in love with life, you know? He you know, up and left Argentina and the soft life and everything to go fight for freedom in Cuba, you know? And then to go fight in Bolivia. But I think he was a beautiful lover, you know? Uh, you, you want to say he's an evil person because he killed people? No, I, 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 I'm not I, saying that. I, I, I think, I think it's all, me you know, uh, I didn't think, uh, uh, you know, uh, life wiggles. There aren't no absolutes. Yeah, yeah. and we're general statements from there. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know say. No, I was just wondering that uh, if you thought that if Bernadine feels it's right to shoot you, <laughs> I might agree with her. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd certainly consider her opinion. <laughs> yeah. well, it's nice to know you have a friend. Uh, the only thing that I was trying to get at is, is whether you thought that people reading... You believe in God? No. Uh-huh. See, that's your first mistake. Okay. Are you a sophomore? Do you? Are you a sophomore? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. In yeah. engineering. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. When you get in there. What? When you get into something really good, like archaeology, and you start digging around, <laughs> you'll see. Do you believe in God? Sure. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Why not? <laughs> well, what can I say? <laughs> Why? <laughs> The next time I see him, though, I'm going to tell him you don't. Well, what can you say to that? <laughs> um, I'll, t I'll give you a clue, though. When you go to heaven, wear bowling shoes because you don't want to mark up the floor. Okay. I like that. I'm very into God because uh, Sunday, you know. Uh, you know why? Because this, I just figured out the theme song of your show is called what? Seven, uh, six days on the road. Right. And you don't say what happened on the seventh day. God did the rest. Do you ever think about that? Have you ever heard that uh, there's an album called The Seventh Day? And they start off and they go, the first six six days God made the world. And on the there's seventh day we took off. Um, no, I don't, I don't know who did I think the group is called. You know, just God's Snow, maybe. I don't know, they have some music, you know, like the Jesus Christ Superstar thing, but um, it goes, on Fantastic the first six album. days, um, God created the world, and on the seventh day, we took over, cool. and then they go into music. Do you like Jesus Christ Superstar, the album? Yeah. So I'm just I, like, yeah. I like the sweatshirt, better. Where do you get those? Okay. Oh, okay. They have 30, 31 delicious flavors. <laughs> <laughs> like everything else kind of... I just did a, uh, uh, made a record. And one day I came in with a group called the Joint Chiefs and Staff Religious Songs. Religious songs? And, uh, mm -hmm. Some political. Uh, there are stranger things <laughs> between heaven or earth than you or I know, Herr Frankenstein. Is that one of the songs? That's a famous head rock, yeah, actually. It's a famous yeah. line. It's a famous movie. You know, and he summed it up. Is that is that album gonna be released soon? We'll have to get a copy of it. Um, well, I know some reason. I mean, I you know we didn't even hit a playback. We just did it ad lib, right? You know, oh. did the whole thing on laughing gas. It's a lot of giggles. I'd never tried it before. I'd read about it in Henry James, you know, variety of religious experience. Yeah. Just right there, I go oh, bragging again. See, immediately I forget. You know, I I just I'm like a chameleon. No, I end up at a college station. I start quoting from books. It's insane. It's, it's I went to self. college. 
Brandeis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that before. You graduated, right? I went to graduate school too. Oh. A couple degrees. As you said, I think uh, after the Chicago trial, yeah. good Jewish boy. <laughs> yeah. Right. I remember reading that. Um, Just a nice Jewish kid trying to work my way through prison. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I sound I'm still I'm sitting here, huh? So I guess you made it. Yeah. For now. I'm so surprised. I'm as surprised as, as a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm as surprised as Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Do you? Um, I had a lot of trials. How many have you had? It seems like every time you pick up a newspaper, you have another one. I had one right out here in the corner. You know, that was uh, last year? Uh, and in 68. Oh, I didn't know you were arrested here, though. Yeah. They had to be in? Yeah. Up here. And I came up with all the boxes and Mark Rudd and Gus Rice back all. I was arrested, yeah. It was incredible. I'll tell you, that, uh, I was arrested with about 22, 22. I was thrown in a van. I was outside. I'd never been in any of the buildings. So they were taking the people out of Avery Hall, I later learned, which I'd never seen. Still don't even know what place it is. So uh, I went up, uh, you know, uh, the policeman attacked this crowd. We were giving a speech, and I mean, I was giving a speech, and people were trying to get them really involved, and then I can talk about it now. I was trying to get them really into it, you know? <laughs> so uh, some cop decked me from behind, you know, got me right yeah. in the head, threw me in the paddy wagon with all these Avery people, engineers or something, all bleeding like, oh, tremendous martyrs, singing with some weird, you know, uh, down by the riverside or something, I don't know. So we ended up at the police station. Anyway, when we were all on trial, I mean, it took two weeks for the 21 people to get dismissed, you know, something like that. Mm. My, my, uh, my court history lasted like three years, and then 17 appearances, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they, may, they kind of make a selective thing, you know, that goes on. I mean, I think two people of all the arrests, and the 700 arrests in the Chicago demonstrations in 68, two went to jail, you know, and one, one was, the first name was Jerry, and the other one was Abby, you know. <laughs> That's where it's at. Yeah. Yeah. It's like mid -day thing. So uh, I, I, I'm just talking about people who ain't into going to jail. So I'm just, you know, like, yeah. take me! <laughs> you know. Yeah. Are you one of them? No. Uh, no, no. Get me out right away. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what's it saying? How about out here? Yeah. Oh, eventually I had to uh, plead, get, cop a plea of guilty, you know, of uh, criminal trespassing in Avery Hall, which I still have not been into to this day, you know. <laughs> But uh, they had it down that I was in Avery Hall because all the other people were, you know. They lumped them all together. You know what mass yeah. arrest thing is like. And I had to pay some huge fine or something to cop a plea. Would they catch cop you on, please. would they arrest you on for the major thing? They got you up here in New York, I think it was. Well, uh, I was running around the streets with everybody else doing what we won't discuss right here now on the radio station, but in general having a very good time. Yeah. I, I mean... I'll tell you something about this demonstration, guys. It was really weird. You know, I, I think, um, well, the first thing was, you made a couple strategy mistakes, you know, not expecting the cops to clear out the park right off on that yeah, side. You know, that was really bad, you know, because uh, that thing would have built up, you know, and there could have been, uh, you know, 100,000 people there. Most people could have got involved, you know. People could have stayed more. But anyway, there was the, uh, Nixon made an announcement. He said, you know, there's a lot of messy, snotty brats running around the streets, so uh, everybody who works for the government should come in early. You know? Come in at 6 in the morning. Okay? So all the organizers, all the May Day people say, 6 in the morning? Well, we got to get out in the streets at 5. Right? Yeah. But see, uh, most of the organizers hadn't worked, and they certainly hadn't worked for the government, because, like, nobody's going to go to, you know, you hear the president say, you hear there's going to be a tie-up. I mean, you know, you, st you start booking in at the local uh, tennis club, you know, a local golf. I mean, you're not even going to work. Forget it, you know? Yeah. And you're certainly not going to wake up at 6 in the morning, because you can always come in and say to your boss, I couldn't get through uh, DuPont Circle, you know, they were running all over the place, you know? And, you know, just fudge it a little, right? Yeah. But uh, seeing as how uh, they didn't work, they believed the president. I mean, they believed him. And they believed that all the government workers were coming in early. So you get out in the, you know, and I'm just a soldier just like you. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I get out there with my gas mask and my knapsack, you know, and my long hair, right? 5 a.m., I'm looking around. Well, what's happening? All I see is these other people with knapsacks, you know, gas masks, helmets, long hair. Where the people that work for the government? Where are the cops? There's nobody, there's nobody but cops and freaks. Yeah. I mean, they, they cleaned the whole thing up in about two hours. It was incredible. What minute? It's great strategy, great military operation. But, uh, 
was it was surprising how fast we came in second. Went. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's Don't good. Knock it. Uh, I have to say it's WKCR-FM in New York. That's what you're listening to. Um, Good. Are you going to say something? Then they're gold bullion. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You don't want to do an ad? For gold bullion? Why not? They can send an ad. I mean, it's, you know, it's the most radical thing you can do on these snotty stations that think they're above the people that don't ad. Do you think we're a brute? (laughs) 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 If you want to smell good, we suggest yes. brute. That's a man smell. You know what I mean? You can really tell. You ought to do one of those commercials. Have you ever? Yeah, this is a kind of chair for it, you know. Yeah, it's, this is just the scene they use too. Probably, just kind of sitting there. Maybe. See, you might. You might. They wanted my when my kid was born on the twentieth uh, uh, of July, uh, which is the anniversary of the uh, moon landing. You know, and the, mm. the Tang people want to sign him up. For what, a commercial? Yeah. Well, that's the whole point of going to movies, not to sell Tang. That's, that's probably them. true. Think about it. But uh, anyway, at May Day, so, uh, see, yeah, I'm a little tricky, so I didn't get caught by 7. I'm still going, like 10 o'clock, I'm going pretty good, you know, 9, mm. 10 o'clock. And I, I ain't no young chicken anymore, I mean, I'm 49 years old, you know, running around the street's kind of weird, you know. Uh, so, uh... Finally, some, uh, you know, uh, piggy wiggies, you know, uh, they trapped me. They got me, real, you know, real good. One, oh, God, he must have, you know, it was like yeah. King Kong. I mean, he hit me from behind, you know, rolled me over, hit me about six good whacks in the face with his club. And uh, I passed out a few times, you know, threw me in a bus and uh, got dragged uh, into the compound, thrown in the car, never really arrested, you know, no papers fell yeah. or nothing. And uh, people were cool because they all recognized me, but they didn't say nothing, you know. And, uh, I got uh, patched up by Dr. Spock. Yeah. Really? Yeah, and the kind of he's in there. So. Yeah. I was like, he comes staggering in the town. I said, hey, Ben, how come you making house calls? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, did, he didn't charge. It was good to the right fee. The price was right. Yeah. So uh, then I got smuggled out. I, was like, I asked for an escape from jail. And uh, I ended up back in the yard about five days later. The FBI is like crawling all over us. Mm. Place in the Lower East Side, you know, and they, they put me in real rough, rough stuff too, man. Mm. What 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 they charge you with when when they grabbed you up here? Well, seeing as how I had a broken nose and a slip disc and twenty stitches in my head, they uh, charged me with assault. Can't argue with logic. Then right? they charged me with uh, crossing state lines to incite riot for a speech I gave in Norman, Oklahoma, about uh, three days before advising people go to Washington, and it's a real study. I mean, I would say uh, the 40 arrests I had, everyone was involved in free speech, just like the book you know, that's out in public. Mm-hmm. They're all free speech cases. This uh, Interstate Riot Act, which was the same thing in Chicago, you know, 2101. Yeah. It's a fantastically brilliant act. I mean, there are law, law people up, you should get them on and talk about that law. It's very meta. Strum Thurman, Civil Rights Act. <laughs> yeah. You remember him? Great civil rights leader. Not very well. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Whitney Young. They Ronald just, the King, Strom Thurmond, you remember. The yeah, I don't know. Strom Thurmond, I'm not that familiar with. Uh, with the other he's, he, uh, he's, he did a lot of marching and singing. You know, you don't know something? Oh. Here's with Snick in the early days. Huh. So, uh, he has this uh, anti riot act, part of a civil rights law. So, uh, I got five years in Chicago for it. I faced another five in Washington. And the speech I gave was like 10 minutes long, you know, not very awe inspiring. It was a spur of the moment kind of thing. I'd been in Stillman, Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, uh, it was a typical kind of speech for me in a place like Oklahoma. I mean, we had a, uh, a year before I'd been invited there. Uh, you know, a uh, uh, couple state senators will then sue the university saying that they can't use the funds for this, et cetera, et cetera. The legislators will, will start enacting a law that says uh, I'm not allowed into the state. You know, clearly unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. But now the onus is on the defendant, or like the student group, to see to fight it in the courts. Well, the ACLU and a student group fought it in the courts and, and finally won after a year and after spending $3,800. You know, so uh, in a number of states I'm banned. But anyway, I went to Stillman, Oklahoma, you know, because it's, it's close to my home. Mus- Mus- I was born in Muskogee. Muskogee. <laughs> it's one of those names you always hear people talk about. 
Muskogee. How, how big is Muskogee? Yeah. How, how big is Muskogee? I ain't from there. Uh, it ain't too big. No haggard things out there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Well, uh, so, um, I gave the speech in Stillwater, and then some people said, you know, you should come down to the University of Oklahoma huh. in Norman. And I spoke for about 10 minutes ad hoc, you know, and it's just like, go to Washington. I said, there were about four lines in the speech. You know, we're going to make Washington look like a YAF convention. We're going to make Washington, Washington's going to make Chicago look like a YAF convention. That's one line. The other line is, we're, we're going to do it, we're going to do it in the streets. That's two. The third line is, uh, if the government doesn't stop the war, we're going to stop the government. And I turn and look at my imaginary watch and say, they have 47 hours <laughs> left. Okay, those three lines, uh, the gut, hardcore case against the go that the government has against me. That's it. And I'll just bring the tape. I'm not even swearing. I didn't swear nothing. It was all about Vietnam, you know. I was feeling very close to that because I had just come back from Paris where I met with the Vietnamese. Oh, I didn't know you were over there. Yeah, hey, Madame Bing gave me that ring. See that ring? That was a jet plane in Laos about six months ago. They, they make, uh, they're the original hippies, you know? They shoot down jet planes and make rings, beads, uh, water Recycle. pipes. Recycle. Is it? Yeah. It's true. They have, uh, they don't have these kind of metal, I mean, this is like beryllium cobalt ring, you know? I feel, I feel like it. It's, it's almost it's like tin or aluminum or something. It feels like it's yeah. light as well. It's good. It's kind of nice, right? So, uh, they don't have these kind of metals natural to Vietnam, but they now have 12 foundries, you know, just from the scoop up all the bomb casings and the, you know, down jet planes and stuff like that, re recycle. So, you want to get into anything else? You said you just wanted to talk, so, you know. No, man, I'm getting pretty, uh, yeah, it is hot in here. Yeah, it's pretty warm. Um, well, we'll go about our... Our you problems wanna... with your head anyway, you know? <laughs> I don't think we can relate, you know? <laughs> I guess I ain't, I ain't counting on you, you know, to what... Uh, uh, well, okay, well, thanks for got, coming up. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> See so. you around the campus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to some music now.